And today we're going back to the book of Joshua. And today we're dealing with kindness and severity. Kind of an um, interesting message title here, if you would. We're in Joshua chapter 6. We're not going to read the entirety of the chapter, but we're going to be sharing some things throughout the pages of those scriptures that I pray will be a blessing to you. But I want to welcome you back to our series on Joshua and what befitting place that we are today in the great triumph that God's going to give the Israelites in conquering Jericho. You know, the devil will come as a roaring lion in some overwhelming catastrophe in life that we face. And you know, when we're facing those issues and times in our life, sometimes those issues seem shattering to us, don't they? They really bring a sense today that will shake our faith. You know, your faith may be shaken, but let me tell you what, your faith is solid on Christ today. I know sometimes our feelings, our apprehensions, and the worries of life sometimes rob us of the faith that we really, really do have. But things and circumstances and events and things that we face in life sometimes seem to draw our attention away from the Lord and sometimes will pull us to those places that we really should not be and don't want to go. But I'm glad there's a God who waits patiently as we come back and return in our faith walk to Him. But realize today that when we're in those places, and these are real places, I'm going to tell you today, I'm not going to stand up here and give you some something today that will try to hype you up in your flesh to make you feel good or try to give you some false hope. I'm going to give you thus saith the Lord that is in reality our strength, our help, and the direction that we need in our lives. But we find in those places today of catastrophe, in times of shaking, in times that our faith is really going through some troubled waters, you know, we may ask the questions, you know, what is happening to me? Why am I going through this? Why am I facing these circumstances? I mean, sometimes it feels like our world is caving in, doesn't it? Have you ever been there? If you haven't, thank God you haven't, and I pray you never have to go there. But for most of us, we have faced those places in life. It can come in very different ways and fashions and events that we face. But it's in those places that we seem to be somewhat swept off of our feet by the staggering events that we have encountered because they're real. Those things and places in life are real. And they really sometimes bring us to the place that we even may question who we are. We may even question the God of heaven. We may even question our faith. We just really find ourselves in some deep valleys of life. But you know what we must do is do what Joshua did. You know, Joshua stood fast in his faith. Even when the circumstances around you may seem to spell defeat or discouragement or dismay, you've got to anchor yourself on the rock of ages today. Who is your strength? Who is your hope? Who is your help? Because he is our refuge, our strength, and our very present help in time of trouble. So what did Joshua do other than the faith? Well, you know what your faith does? Your faith really brings you to the place that you depend on God. And that's where we have to be today. And whatever we're in, facing, going through, we've got to anchor ourselves in Christ today and depend upon the Lord. Not what somebody has told us, not what we've seen, not what we've experienced, not what we're feeling, any of that today. We've got to depend upon God because He's a God who will never fail you in faith and He's a constant present help in whatever you're facing today. And that's how God works those miracles in our lives if we will learn today to confide, to put our confidence and today I walk in Him. You know, God did in fact, as you're going to see, work a miracle. Let me tell you what, He is a miracle working God. I was in Lynchburg General Hospital this morning, Central Health. And as I walked in the room, the patient was being taken out to, be have, to go have a CT scan done. I asked the, the uh, person that was coming to take Faye out, Faye Brooks, I said, may I have prayer? Do you mind if I have prayer? Thank the Lord. She graciously gave me that permission. And we had prayer, and I just, just put my hand on Faye, and I prayed. Here's a woman who's had two battles with cancer. She's had heart issues and continual problems and now breathing issues. And I just prayed, prayed that God of heaven would work a miracle. You know what? 
I'm not standing before you today saying, boy, I sure hope God does something. I prayed with assurance and even thanked God for what he was going to do. This past week, I was in the hospital with that little lady sitting right there. We prayed, and she had to have our hearts shocked back into rhythm. You know, sometimes it works, and sometimes it don't. Sometimes they shock you once, and it goes into rhythm. Sometimes they shock you, shock you, and shock you again, and it still won't go back into rhythm. We prayed, and we even thank God, if you two will remember, we thank God that he was going to work a miracle and that that one shock was going to be enough to get Rachel's heart back into rhythm. We thank God for what he was going to do. And you know what he did? He did it. Amen. That's the miracle working power of our God. This young man sitting over here that looks as cute as a button and has lost a lot of weight and still as handsome as he can be, and that's because he's married to a pretty lady. Amen. That's what makes him pretty. Amen. This guy has been through hell and high water. He's had cancer. He's had a rough go of it. He's had surgeries, two of them, if I recall. He's been 30-some treatments, 32. And here he sits on a pew this morning praying a bass guitar. Tell me that God does not work miracles. Amen. Maybe you're sitting here. Listen to me, church. Maybe, and you too that are watching by, by uh, this Mevo that's in front of me today on Facebook. Maybe you're sitting in a situation that you need a miracle. As a matter of fact, let me just poll the congregation right now. By an uplifted hand, how many of you stand in need of a miracle from God today? Raise your hands. Look at that. You know what? There's a guy right there that was on a ventilator for over 30 days. And the doctor really had called and said, or told, talked to Mary and said, you know, I don't really see, I don't see how he's going to live. David, you may not have realized that was all going on, but it was, and it was real. And I couldn't even get in the hospital, but let me tell you what, Mary could hold the phone up to David and I could pray over him on a cell phone and believe it's not my prayer, it's not what I did, it's all about what God did because of faith and believing and trust that God brought him through it and he's sitting there today alive and breathing all to the glory of God, amen. I don't know what your hand was raised for, but I'm here to tell you today, our God can do it, whatever it is. He is an able God that will bring you through whatever you're facing, amen. I could go around the room and there are other examples. Shauna, Jerry, Bonnie, I mean, you name it today. Look what God has done. Our God is an able God. Proverbs 10, Proverbs 10 states, the righteous shall never be moved, amen. Thank God we are anchored on the rock of ages today. You're going to see something today in this message that God has placed on my heart today that I believe really comes to a necessity. I like the word imperative. It will bring an imperative to your life if today you will heed what God is saying. Hallelujah. Patty, we can't leave out Renee, can we? Amen. Here's a woman that suffered and suffered and suffered. And I sat in her room last week and had prayer with her. And the doctors, many of them thought it was just a bunch of baloney that she didn't have any issues going on. She lost a lot of weight. She had a problem. And you know she was going to have a surgery. And this surgery was going to be, they were going to put stents in her abdomen area and to help her. And the doctor said, I'm not sure if this is going to work. And he says, if it doesn't work, then we're going to have to go more extensively and cut you open and do a real detailed surgery. We prayed, and you know what we did? Just like we did with all these other folks. We thanked God for what he was going to do. You know what? They were able to do the stents. She's out of the hospital. She's feeling great, and she's eating everything in the house. Tell me, our God, it's not an awesome God. Amen. Walter Britt, how about you? You've been out of commission for several weeks, months. But what happened to you? We believed and we prayed and we trusted God and he worked in your life. That's the power of what our God can do. So therefore today, it's an imperative today that we believe what God is going to give us today in this message. Hebrews 11 and 30 tells us a, this fact that today the, this great victory that happened to the Israelites there at Jericho, it came, this victory came by faith. And today, you may feel like right now, my faith is a little thin. It has not run out yet. And God is still able. There are five facts today that I want to hurl at you today pertaining to faith. Faith in spite of the odds. 
Many times the odds are stacked against us, aren't they? Many times a doctor tells us no way. Many times the circumstances say you're not going to get through what you're facing. But let me tell you what, the word of God today tells us there's a God who's bigger than whatever we're facing. And by faith, even when the odds are stacked against us, let me tell you what God did. He brought the Hebrews through that and he gave them victory and he brought the walls down as we're going to see here in a few moments. So faith in spite of the odds. Secondly, Faith follows God's strange plan. I'm telling you, sometimes God makes no sense. I can honestly tell you most of the occurrences and the things that God's done in my life, it didn't make any sense. Humanly speaking, mentally speaking, any way speaking, it didn't make any sense. And really, I just had to reach out by faith and trust God. But when God's plans don't make any sense, you still trust Him. You still have Faith in this God and his plans included for the Israelites, it meant marching, blowing horns, and shouting. Now, I have a military background. I'm going to tell you, I've never heard that work in a military con confrontation that you were facing. It just didn't make any sense. And I'm sure it didn't make any sense either for the Israelites. I'm sure it didn't make any sense when God spoke to Joshua oh, that evening before and he gave him the plan of how the victory is going to come. But let me tell you what, it was not by military might, but it was by the might of the master, because without God, there's nothing too hard for him. Amen. Thirdly, we find faith believes God for a victory today. God, the God, he was in the battle, wasn't he? And you know what? Whatever battle you're going in, remember David when he stood out there in that valley facing that behemoth, that giant named Goliath? What did he do? He didn't say, hey, buddy, I, I hope you're having a good day, and I hope you don't hit me too hard. I hope everything will be okay. No, he said, the battle is the Lord's, amen. amen. And I'm telling you, the Lord is in the battle, but here's the neat thing about it. He's already won the battle, and he did it at the cross for you and I, amen. And the victory is ours. Faith in God always brings a victory. Fourthly, faith is the is expressed in persevering. Here's a word you're really going to love. Obedience. Persevering obedience. Obedience is putting your faith into action. Amen. You know, when I prayed this morning, and as I prayed with people, you know, I don't walk out of there saying, now God, don't make me look bad. God will never make you look bad when you're in his will. Because God is a God that we have faith in that will always come through. But today, you've got to have a persevering obedience. You've got to put your confidence in God, regardless of whatever you're facing today. And then, fifthly, faith overcomes doubt. Belief is always the first part of faith. Let me say it again. Today, belief... Believing is always the first part of faith. Belief and faith leaves no room for doubt. If you're sitting here today or watching and you're saying, well, I just don't, I just don't know what, i tell you what you're going to do. You're going to tell doubt to get out of the room. Because today you've got to have belief. You've got to believe what God can do and what his word says he will do. And you've got to couple that with the faith that you've got in God. Remember what Jesus said about faith in, in Mark eleven twenty two, 22, I believe it is. Have faith in God. That's a complete sentence. And that's what you need. Amen. So you realize when Jesus always leads the way, the walls will always come down. Amen today. I'm not here today to give you today my thoughts, my opinions, or my ideas. I'm here today to tell you what God says. And therefore, today, we never go wrong. So let's open our Bibles to Joshua 6 as I today read verses 1 through 7. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. It's because of what God had done for them. None went out. None came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given, now I asked the 930 crowd, for those of you who are English majors, I'm going to read that little, little part, and I'm going to ask you what, sent, what tense that's in. I have given 
I have given into thine hand Jericho. What tense is that? Past tense. It was already declared. It was already given. And the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall come past the city, all ye men of war. That was kind of interesting to me. He called them mighty men of war. They couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. They were not combative. They didn't know anything about combat and winning wars. They didn't even have the tools to fight with. You don't need it when you've got God, do you? Because he's already won the battle. So, man, this is so good. I just, this is so good. Come past the city, all ye men of war. And when the devil's telling you, you ain't that, and you're not even a good bag of chips and a Pepsi Cola, you just tell him that you are more than a conqueror through him that loves you. Amen. Praise God. And go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. Six days around the city. And seven priests shall bear before the ark, that's the ark of the covenant, seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall come past the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on and come past the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord. You know, when it comes to Joshua, Jericho, God's people, what is this story really about today? You say, well, you just said it's about Jericho, it's about walls, it's about, you know, this great leadership of Joshua and the people. No, it's not. This is actually today not about the Israelites. It's not about their victory. It's not about Joshua and his spectacular leadership that God had given him. You know what this is all about? It's all about God. That's what this is all about. Isn't that what the Word of God is about? Isn't today, isn't that what our life should be about? It should be about God and Him working in our lives. It's what we need to hear today, and today we need to hear from God. As a nation, as a church, as a people, as family, we need to hear about God, don't we? We don't need to hear all the rhetoric today that we're getting from the news media. We don't need to hear all this, this ridiculous things that's happening in our nation and today, the things that are occurring. We need to hear from God, and that's what's the problem. We're putting too much emphasis today on our problem instead of our problem solver. We need to get back to God and get back today to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and once again embrace his word and start living what God has said. You know, when you stick close to the Bible, you'll hear from God. When you put your nose down into God's Word and read it, study it, and meditate on it and live it, you're going to get close to God. But when you're not walking with Him, it's really hard to hear from Him, isn't it? Folks, let me tell you what. God is desirous to speak to our hearts. But the question is, how desirous are we to hear what God is speaking? We don't need to hear about be, the, being bad, how, the, how bad the Canaanites were. We don't need to hear about how supposedly, how good the Israelites were or how today that Joshua would lead the children of Israel today. What our soul needs today is God. What our hearts need is God. What our lives need is God. What our family needs is God. What our nation needs is God. What our churches need is God. And folks, it's not going to work until we get God back on the place where he belongs. And that's in control and sovereign over the affairs of man today. Who is this God? Who is this God and how does he work and what does he do? And really today, what does he want? I mean, today, what is God trying to speak to our hearts? Where do we really fit into this plan that God has for our life. Well, Pastor, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little bit afraid of the plan of God because I never know where he's going to take me, lead me, or send me, or whatever. You don't ever be afraid of God's plan. 
Because where that finger points of God, his hand will provide, won't it? Every time. So you've got to look at it today. What is it about God? What is it about him in our lives? Let's take a moment and catch up. We've been away from Joshua for a couple of weeks, and I really enjoyed that little mini-series we had in the book of Revelation, chapter 22. And man, it was potent. But now we're back to Joshua. God had performed a great miracle. He had delivered the children of Israel out of the bondage that they were in in Egypt. 400 years they'd been making brick for the enemy. 400 years they'd been in slavery. 400 years they'd been oppressed. Then by the power of God and using a man by the name of Moses that God spoke to on the backside of the desert, God provided a plan of deliverance. You know, unfortunately, the children of Israel would not follow the plan that God had for them. Constantly they would sway from God's plan. Constantly they would leave the foe. Constantly they would be disobedient. But aren't you glad that he's a long-suffering God? Because today I'm not going to look at them and judge them because you know what? We as humans and we as Christians, we're just as bad. Sometimes we don't keep our eye on God. And sometimes we let the circumstances of life overwhelm us. So God brought the children of Israel. He brought them through and he brought them out of the wilderness. Then God brought on the scene a man by the name of Joshua. He would be a mighty leader. His resume didn't say a lot. Really, he didn't really fit the job if you look at his resume. But you know, it's amazing how God can take the person and make the person fit the job that he's called them to do. And so here it is, they're faced with the Jordan River and it's out of its banks because it's in the spring of the year when it can be in excess of a mile out of its banks. Not just a little creek flowing through, and I've been to Israel, I've seen it, and sometimes it's as wide as this pew in front of me. Sometimes it's not half that size in places, but in this occasion it was out of its banks in the width of more than a mile. What did God do? God spoke and the waters just heaped up. He dried the ground and he made a safe passage on dry ground, a highway that he would prepare for his children to get to the promised land. God made a way. So we see at the Jordan, the flowing waters were stopped and God made a way and he made a highway for them into the very promise that he had provided for them. They entered the promised land and through that process, what did God do? He cleansed their hearts. He took the shame, the sin away from them. Aren't you glad that we have a God who redeems us? Aren't you glad that we have a God who cleanses us? Aren't you glad that we got a God that washes us and makes us as white as the white driven snow? That's what he does within each of us today. So then God gave them back something that they had not had. He gave them back what is called the Passover. And this Passover would be a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do on the cross where he would be the Passover lamb, where he would give his life, where he would shed his blood, where he would make a way. And now in chapter 6, the people of God has to walk into what God has promised them. The promised land, you say, yeah, but they were faced with an obstacle. Let me tell you what, with God, those obstacles today, nothing but really uh, an illusion, a mirage, because God brings walls down, doesn't he? God moves mountains, doesn't he? God makes ways today that you can't even comprehend and understand. That's the power of our God. And that's what our God can do. So what we see in chapter 6 is the people are having to trust God. Friend, this same God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the call for you and I is this. Trust God. I need a miracle. Trust God. I need a deliverance. Trust God. I need help. Trust God. I need hope. Trust God. You can trust God because today God can do all things above and beyond whatever you could imagine today. Amen. So the question then comes. The question comes today. Do you trust that God is working? Do you trust today that God is good? Let me say that again. God is good. Do you trust today that our God's a holy God? Do you trust today that our God is real? All these other false gods, they're no gods at all. And if they were, they are God with a little G. They could do absolutely nothing. But we serve the one true mighty God, maker of heaven and earth. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's the God that we serve. So this passage, it's more than just a quaint story about an event that happened in ancient times. 
It's more than just about a wall coming down and the people marching in. Let me tell you, this, this story, this account, invites us to look squarely into the very face of God. That's where he's bringing us today and to believe exactly what this theme proclaims today. The theme is this. God is kind in grace and God is severe in judgment. You mark it down. His grace is sufficient. But one day, all those that have shunned the grace of God and have trampled over the, the blood of Christ, one day, judgment is coming. Amen. Amos said, prepare to meet your God. This is not a message about fear. This is a message about fact. And this is the message about a God who today can turn your fear into faith. Amen. Let me give you several points, and you've got them on your study guides there. Number one, there's nothing too hard for God. And the church said, Amen. You know what you need to tattoo on your soul? There's nothing too hard for God. Amen. You need to remember nothing. But preacher, you don't know what I'm going. Nothing is too hard for God. You don't know what I'm facing. You don't know what the doctor said. You don't know my finances. You don't know what's going on in my family. You don't know the headaches and the heartaches I'm facing. I remind you today, nothing is too hard for God. Amen. This thought is found in verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 is kind of a blunt statement of fact. Jericho was a walled city. It was built to be siege-proof. Massive walls. Huge gates. Could not be penetrated. So the Israelites, they didn't know how to take the city. They were not combative. They were not even combat trained. Most of them had been farmers and all kinds of walks of life, but none of them were really in a position of combat and training. They didn't even have a battering ram. How are you going to knock the gates and the doors down? You don't even have a battering ram. How are you going to climb up those massive, thick walls? You don't even have a ladder. Man, odds were stacked against them, wasn't it? They didn't have the Air Force F-15 EX fighter jets. They didn't have the SEP V-3 tanks that the Army has. They didn't have a, a B-21 Raider bomber. They didn't have none of that. Why well, do you know all about that stuff? Because I was in the Air Force. This was Fortress Jericho with walls that could not come down. They were built to fortify that city and the people in it. So if you look at it in the reality of what it is, it's a hopeless situation for Israel. Then God says, get out there and march around the wall. Carry the Ark of the Covenant. Be sure to carry the ram's horns. And on the seventh day, do that seven times, blow a horn, shout. What? What kind of military genius is this you know let me tell you something they were in a hopeless situation but listen today you sitting here and those of you who are watching what hopeless situation have you found yourself in what are you going through right now that you don't have answers for you don't have ways out of you don't have deliverance you don't know what to do you're worrying about it you're losing sleep over it you're worrying about this and your family and all the issues of life let me tell you what hopelessness is. It's a bottomless hole today that you just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper in. Let me tell you what else hopelessness, hopelessness is today. It's a soul vacuum. It just sucks everything out of you and just gets you to the point that you want to give up, quit, and die. Let me tell you what. That's not God. And if that's your mentality today, I challenge you to change your mentality. You're here in this church right now. You're watching. That tells me that God's not through with you yet. And God can work a mighty miracle in your life if you'll learn to trust him. So God told Joshua in chapter 2, See, I've given, I've given, I've given into thine hand Jericho. So God is speaking in the past to make application in the future. <laughs> That's the way God works. Christianity, let me tell you what it is. It's the finished work of Christ on the cross. When Jesus said it is finished, it was finished. And not only that, he wasn't finished. 
but the devil was. Sin was. The world was. And everything that was against you was. And today, through the cross, he's given us a miraculous victory that we have in him today. What he did in the past, let me tell you what, is by the means of the cross that will change you and change your outlook on life and give you a victory that you need in Christ today. The gospel is not you doing better. Well, I'm trying to do better. I sick, get so sick of these cliches. I'm trying. I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to survive. I'm trying to hang on. I'm trying to get through. That's your problem. It's you. It's you. You're, you're the problem. Go look in the mirror. You're the problem. But in a mirror, I'd sit up here before you say, you're the problem. Because it's all about, I'm trying. I'm trying. You don't need to try when God's already secured it for you. You need to stop looking at what you're doing and look at what he's already done and what he's provided today. The gospel is the fact that Jesus is the only life and the better life. Amen. So every person today, the reality is every person is a sinner. We all deserve to be condemned. We all deserve to go to hell, but instead you go to the cross and you get the delivering power of Almighty God that sets you free from yourself, the world, the flesh, and everything else, and the devil, and thank God whom he makes free is free indeed, amen. So it's at the cross, it's at the cross that God judges sin. And any sinner that will believe in the finished work of what Christ accomplished at the cross can be saved. I'm glad I'm saved. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm saved. So there's nothing too hard for our God, is there? Amen. Secondly, today, in weakness, God is made stronger. So this is found in verses 3 through 5. From a human perspective, circling a city is not a good battle plan. You look at it. Somebody told you, well, to win your victory, you've got to go out and circle a city seven times, blow a horn, and shout. You say, what boat did you come in on? <laughs> Who hit you in the head with a rock? The head, preacher head butt you or something or what? No, it's God's plan. So the people taking the land, it really, what it does, it highlights God's glory, his mercy, and his justice. That's what it highlights today. That's what you're waiting for, Shauna. Amen. God initiates the conquest of the land. It's all God's work. Get your hands off of what God's trying to do. Just let him direct your life. God put even fear in the enemies. You know, they were peering over those massive walls when they saw God just take those waters, pull them back, dry up the land and say, let's go, boys, let's go. You got a passage, you got a dry highway to get to the other side on. What do you think they thought about that? You imagine seeing that with your eyes. A, a Jordan River that's a mile in width, and God pulls it back, dries up the ground, and here they go, boogieing right on across it. <laughs> Amen. Tell me, God's not an amazing God. He gives the Jews this insane plan, and all boils down to this. Israel had to trust what God was telling them. And I'm here to tell you today, you and I have got to learn to start trusting what God has said in his word. You've got to put confidence in God, not what some talking head has said on the news or what the CDC has said or what the president has said or what the governor has said or the, anybody else has said. Put your trust in God. Amen. He's the God of deliverance today. Not a governor or another, no other political party. Even when you can't see what God is doing, you must trust him and put your faith and your confidence in him. See, God works in the ridiculous so that no human being can stand before him and boast in his presence. That teaches us a lesson in humility and humbleness, doesn't it? Because if it wasn't for the Lord we would have no hope. But with him, we have all the hope that is necessary. This is about God working in your weaknesses today. And listen, let me tell you something. Don't be embarrassed and don't be in a position of despising today your weakness, your failures, your hurts, and the things of life. We all are made strong through him. 
So it's where we get to the end of ourselves that we can't do. You know, we'd learn a lot quicker if we just learned to do that in the beginning, that we can't do anything, but in Christ we can do all things. Amen. That's really an attitude, isn't it? So in Christ, this is the way God sees you. In Christ, we're made trophies of God's grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Think of that for a moment. Thirdly, God's plan is perfect. Doesn't always make sense, but it's a perfect plan. So whatever God's plan is for our lives, <laughs> make this real simple. You need to be in it. Not contrary to it. God does not need your advice. Well, I just want to, uh, God, do you? No, God doesn't want to hear your mouth. <laughs> Except to praise him. God does not need your counsel. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God didn't go into a state of deliriousness and panic and look at the Spirit of God and look to Jesus and say, what do we do now? No, he already knew. God already foreknew. And God had already made a plan. Read Genesis 3.15. Then read what Christ did at the cross. Because that's the fruition of what he prophesied in Genesis 3.15. Be assured today God's plan is doubly perfect. Not just perfect, it's doubly perfect. Today it's a perfect plan of God. And in verse 6 and 7 you find the term the ark of the Lord that is representative of God's presence. Do you realize in Christ, I mean to say people in the room, shout amen. amen. You can do it home too, amen. If you're saved today, you need, you need to praise God and you need to declare it. But you also understand today, you're never outside the, the realm of safety and provision. He's always with you. For he said, I will never leave nor forsake you. So the plan of God is perfect. And it pulsates with God's presence. However, the plan today requires something that most of us don't have. And we don't like. And it's called patience. Hmm. Patience. Preacher, I don't have any of it. Welcome to the club. I don't either. But I've learned that you better trust God and put your confidence in Him. I mean, you like, probably like I am. When you want something, you don't want it right now. You wanted it three days ago. You want it to happen now. I see that witness. Amen. But I'm going to tell you, you can't get ahead of him, and you can't lag, lag behind him. You've got to trust God in all things. He will develop, as he has in my life, patience. Because what happened? The Israelites, they did the same thing for six days, around the walls, around the walls, around the walls. Six days, man. I mean, do you think that got monotonous? All right, guys, time to go march around the wall time. Be sure to bring those rams, horns. Be sure to bring the Ark of the Covenant. And they are mumbling, what in the world is going on? He lost his mind. What are we doing? No, they had patience to trust what God had said. But how many times do we do that? God says, and we don't see the evidence. You know, six days, nothing happened. Six days they did this, nothing happened, nothing. But kick up a lot of dust. We want satisfaction in the results, don't we? But think about this. In our lives, it's difficult today, and it's, different, it's a different kind of faithfulness today to keep going even when you don't see the results. Because we want it. You can't understand why that clerk in that little room that just took your order doesn't have that hamburger sitting in your car as soon as you said the word. <laughs> it takes patience to walk in God's plan, which today produces the element of trust in your life. The last thing, God's judgment is the backdrop of God's mercy. Verses 15 through 25. This was the downfall of Jericho, the story concludes with its total destruction. And it's amazing how God did it. He said the walls came down flat. That means they didn't have to climb over stuff to get in there and claim the victory. You know, 
it was also something else that's hidden in this message, that in these passages, here is the deliverance of a, Ra a woman by the name of Rahab, who was a prostitute. And here we see the complete act of God's judgment. But when God decided to save someone in Jericho, he didn't say, hmm, let me see, who's got the most money, or who's the most noble, who's got the best name, who's got the greatest possessions, no, he chose the lowest of the low. He chose a prostitute. Isn't that what he did for you and I today? We had nothing to bring to God except shame and sin and shackles. But when we came to the cross and we asked for the mercy by grace, the shackles fell off and the shame was gone and our sins were removed and we were declared as trophies of God's grace. Amen. That's what he does. Realizing this, his blood, his grace, his cross today is the means of deliverance. And today I got five little quick things I'm going to give you and I'm through. The gospel is in five things today. Number one, grace. The gospel is in the grace of God. Grace comes and it saves lost sinners. I am a recipient of the grace of God. Amen. And I pray you are too. Secondly, faith. It was by faith that Rahab believed, and by faith she didn't perish. Amen. And today, by faith, for we are saved by grace through faith, we too shall not perish. Third evidence, Rahab acted in her faith. And what she did with the spies was evidence. She didn't know what God was doing, but she had enough faith in God to receive his message of deliverance and follow his plan. Fourth, this created then the evidence of the joy that she had in her life. Rahab was brought into the family of God. And you realize today by salvation you've been saved and you too have been brought into the family of God. She was made a part of God's kingdom. And you know what she had? She had then an undeniable and an unchangeable faith. I don't care what is happening in your life. I don't care what, what obstacles you may face. I don't care how deep and dark the valley is that you go through. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. And that's exactly what she had. And lastly, she had legacy. Matthew Writing of the genealogy of Jesus, guess who's included in the name of the genealogy line? Rahab. See, God is kind in grace, but God is severe in judgment. Make sure that you know the God of grace, that you will escape the severity of his judgment. And I pray today that if you do not know this good grace of God, I pray that you'll come and receive him as your Savior, whether you're at home or whether you're in this sanctuary or whether you're watching by television. We've got to realize we're all sinners. We've got to realize Christ died on the cross for our sins. And we realize that deliverance comes in the fact that we receive him and accept him and name him as our Lord. And if you've never done that, I invite you to do it right now. Pray a prayer like this. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of your salvation. Forgive me of my sin of rejecting you, come into my heart, my life, and save me. And on the authority of God's word, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. What's lying before you in your life today? Is that hopelessness and struggle? And do you need encouragement? Do you need strength? Do you need direction? Do you need help? I'm telling you today, Nothing is too hard for our God. Whatever your need, he is able to meet that need. And you'll find his presence, his power, and his deliverance when you come and cry out to him today.